Hello and welcome back to the Sharks World. This video is the final piece in a three-part series on a new article talking about shark intelligence. Hopefully you guys have actually gone and read the source article linked in the description. If not, make sure you do so after you've watched this video, as well as the previous two parts. There are a lot of little details and graphs that add more context to what I cover. With those caveats out of the way, let's dive right in. Grab you a cold drink, pull up a chair to the table, and let's take a look at Shark Intelligence, Part 5. So, the next category of the many categories in this article is Spatial Learning. This particular topic has actually been well studied in Elasma Brunkai, and in these particular experiments, they mainly focused on freshwater stingrays and our friends, the bamboo sharks. According to the article, both the rays and the sharks could use multiple orientation strategies to remember spatial tasks for at least six weeks, though I think sharks can remember stuff like that for much longer. For the sake of clarity, spatial learning or spatial memory as some will refer to it as, is basically the process where an organism uses its environment to learn and remember where things are or where it has been. It's the process you use when you're driving somewhere you've been to a few times but don't remember exactly where. So you use street names, certain buildings, and landmarks you remember to orient yourself to where you're going. I know nowadays we just use Google Maps and GPS, but you get the point. The scientists suggest through multiple comparative studies that different spatial learning cues sharks use are likely linked to the environment the animals live in. The tests done in this article involved tagging sharks with acoustic transmitters similar to what they used in my social sharks videos about sand tiger sharks. In this case, they tested lemon sharks by displacing them, or in other words, taking them 10 miles from their home to see if they could find their way back. Needless to say, the sharks succeeded very easily. The same went for our buddies the Port Jackson sharks. They noted that these sharks have a very complex migration every year, similar to sand tiger sharks. The sharks not only return to the same bay, but the same reef spot year after year. What's even more incredible is that the juveniles have learned these routes as well. Scientists are unsure how sharks are able to do this so well, but they speculate same as I do. It's likely a multitude of factors that they use through their senses, from the magnetic fields of the earth, to their spatial learning as we just covered, and their olfactory unit. It's the same concept I highlighted going over how sharks hunt using their senses a few videos back, where it's not just one sense leading them all, but all of their senses working as one, with certain ones being used over others depending on the context of the situation. The scientists were curious how the juveniles were able to learn the migration routes, since there's no parental care in most species of sharks. They hypothesized, however, that the routes are passed on culturally. We established in the last video that sharks do have methods of sharing information through social learning, reinforcing my statement that sharks are more social than the public gives them credit. Now, let's move on to the next topic, time, place, learning. For those who don't know, time, place, learning is the process where animals associate certain times and or places for certain resources, usually food. Imagine a gentleman who sells Celsius every Tuesday at noon in front of your local grocery store. If you're like me and you drink a lot of Celsius, I would associate Tuesday at noon in the front of my grocery store with Celsius. The article notes several examples where sharks and rays, because of human activities, certain animals would arrive at certain locations where humans were either feeding 
or disposing of food at certain times of the day that those animals would eat. This shows that sharks and rays, while they don't have clocks or watches, do have some concept of time that they use. Even when some activities ceased, through tracking using those acoustic trackers, the scientists found that sharks would keep the association for up to 90 days. This implies a level of conditioning is possible, whether it be on purpose or not. This also in a way proves that sharks aren't out to get us. People in beach cities like Florida, the Bahamas, California, and other places of the world similar to them go swimming every day, or almost every day. If sharks actually saw us as a food source, they would be returning to the same spots and feeding on people every day, which they don't. Sharks don't eat people in general. Just go look at my videos on actual shark bite statistics and you will see how little they actually bite people. Sharks do not see us as a food source. If anything, they're just curious about us or are just used to our presence and ignore us. Now finally, let's move on to the final topic, cognition in the Anthropocene. Shark toes, WTF is the Anthropocene. To make a very complex topic very simple, the Anthropocene is the climate that has been affected by humans. No, we're not causing the end of the world, but we are affecting it. Sharks are affected by climate change. In the article, the scientists noted that there is more and more evidence that is implying that changes in water temperature and acidity is affecting the cognition in fish. This, however, has been far less studied in sharks. Some of these effects are potentially impaired ability to track odors, the survival of embryos at higher temperatures, and changes in behavior. On the note of embryos, there is one interesting outcome, however. Higher temperatures makes it less likely for embryos to survive, but those that did survive performed better than those raised in normal temperatures. To be clear, when I say normal, I mean the optimal conditions and temperatures for them. To use their terms, the embryos that survived were more strongly lateralized, i.e. they developed a strong right turn basis. Why this is important is because being lateralized has been associated with enhanced cognition. Now again, this is speculation, but based on the tests they performed with juvenile Port Jackson sharks, the sharks raised at higher temperatures as embryos performed better, by a decent margin, no less. This could be seen as a literal case of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So, what have we learned throughout this series of shark intelligence? We've learned that sharks are masters of their senses, able to distinguish a wide variety of stimuli from one another with amazing accuracy that they aren't fooled by illusions and can tell animals apart based on simple movements. We learned that sharks and rays can do very basic math, though it's not their strongest subject. We've learned that sharks have a complex social structure that is comparable to mammals and they use their environment for orientation. Sharks' brains process all this information in an extremely dynamic world and have evolved and survived because of it for millions upon millions of years. Sharks are intelligent animals, far more intelligent than the public realizes, and we've only scratched the surface on this topic. Please do yourself a favor and give this article a full read, and take a look at some of the other work that the authors of this paper have done, as I am very impressed with the results here. I would also like to thank all of you for sticking with me throughout this series. This is going to be where we're going to end this video. Thank you for once again giving me some of your time, and I'll see you in the next video. Until then.